So good afternoon, my friends. Uh, my name is Milan Gandhi, and I work at Red Hat as a senior software maintenance engineer in the production support group for RHEL. And in the next 15 minutes, we are going to talk about some of the common pain points that we encounter while doing the VM core analysis and um, you know, uh, how PYKDM framework helps to make the life easy doing those VM core analysis stuff. The PYKDM framework that I just now mentioned is developed by Alex Sidorenko. He works at HPE. He has been developing and uh, you know, maintaining this particular framework since a long time, maybe early 2000. I have joined I'm, uh, you know, in contributing to this particular project since a uh, couple, uh, couple of years now. And this is being quite extensively used within Red Hat and HP and a couple of partners like QLogic as well. So uh, initially the plan was in fact to present this talk along with Alex. Uh, we created all the materials and everything together, but unfortunately his travel plans, um, c you know, uh, he couldn't make it to Brno at this time, so I'm presenting this alone. So, so starting with some of the basic things, uh, what is VM core analysis or the dump analysis, right? So uh, a dump can be obtained when a system is having a working KDM configuration and uh, it allows you to I didn't, I carefully review all the minute details to present in the data structures within your kernel, maybe it's structure, union, link list, spin locks, mutex, IRQ status, CPU, memory information, and so many other pieces, vital pieces of information out there, right? And in many of the situations, even in the support organization, what we have uh, seen is, and so many times, um, without a VM core captured at the time of issue, it is really, really hard and difficult to pinpoint uh, or to deterministically find out the root cause of problem and find a potential fix for that. So even not only for crash or panic or hang scenarios, even for the performance issues, sometimes the dump collected at the time of issue you know, provides a lot of useful information. For example, there could be processes These are waiting for some locks, and that lock is already held you know, by some other process that is waiting for something else. Now, if you get a dump collected at the time of issue, then it would help us to actually review those lock status and what process is holding those locks and you know, stuff like that. Now, the standard tool for doing the dump analysis, it's Crash. Everyone in the room knows the Crash utility quite well. It provides quite extensive set of commands and options. But um, to use those commands and options quite effectively and to do those analysis, uh, it is required to have you know, a detailed knowledge of this particular you know, uh, structures, unions, or we can say uh, internal knowledge of the kernel uh, subsystems. May that be SCSI subsystem, memory, or the networking subsystem. If you want to dig into uh, the VM core and find out those structure, union details, process, thread information, and all this information, then you have to have the internal knowledge of the kernel and those core paths and everything, right? Then you can use those crash commands uh, quite effectively and pull out the right set of information from the dump really easy. That would make life easier. But uh, you know, uh, for the L1L2 support staff or the kernel newbies who are just starting with the kernel development or here's new, t or for example, system administrator who are used to do uh, the administration stuff, and they're not much familiar with the kernel internals, it becomes a little bit hard to use those commands effectively. And we might end up spending a lot of time just pulling out the basic information from VM core, and you know, afterwards establishing a root cause and finding a potential fix for it, right? Now, when I say uh, finding out the fundamental information from VM core, it's, it could be as simple as LVM volume information, right? For, from your system, if you just want to find out LVM information, all that you have to do is LVS, and you get your LVM volume information. Now, how would you do that from the crash or the dump or multipath information? Like uh, these people who are aware with SAN storage multipath, we can just do multipath hyphen LL, and it will list the multipath devices, underlying SCSI subpaths, its IO routing mechanism or algorithms, and all this information. But to get all this information from the VM core, it might take hours of investigation, and it would also require the internal knowledge of the structures and unions, right? Now, so at, in those situations, it is desirable to have a facility to extend the crash environment with additional set of commands that would help to pull out all this information in a real quick manner. And we can spend our you know, uh, valuable time in actually identifying what went wrong instead of spending a lot of hours in just pulling out the basic information. Right. 
In fact, uh, in Red Hat, this PY Canon framework is quite extensively used. So every VM core that has been uploaded by customer on the Red Hat customer portal goes through the checks uh, by this particular program. Sorry, it's again. So uh, in Red Hat customer portal, every VM core that is uploaded by customer goes through the checks performed by this PY CADM framework. So every support engineer has uh, ready to use those reports and they can verify if it's something matches with the bugzilla. And you know, it, it really reduces the time that is required in VM core analysis at Red Hat. And as well as other partners also using that. Now for the kernel hackers or the developers, it is really easy to pull out this information from VM code because they know the internals of you know, those subsystems. But uh, even for those kernel developers and hackers, doing this manual review repeatedly for so many VM cores on a daily basis is cumbersome, right? We can't process the same information from the same VM core on a daily basis. And so it's kind of, you know, uh, we are automating the stuff using Ansible for different, different purposes. And so why not uh, automate those analysis checks for the VM core analysis as well. That's where PY CADM framework helps you to automate the VM core analysis. So uh, if the kernel developer is working on some particular bugzilla and he knows that you know, this particular core path leads this particular bugzilla when the structure or member variables are having holding one particular value or locks are being processed in some different way or likewise. In that case, they can uh, you know, uh, program all these checks within the programs written in PY CADM framework so that when you execute these uh, programs, those checks would be automatically performed and those users would be notified that this could be the potential bug and maybe flag the bugzilla number. So it would reduce the analysis time quite extensively. Now, uh, the crash uh, is written in, uh, you know, quite intelligently that it uh, already allows you to extend the crash environment and uh, there is a way to create those modules, uh, or we can say crash extensions. Those can be written in C. It could be uh, compiled and dynamically used to extend the crash environment. It's just a matter of using the extend command and giving a path of that particular extension, and you will get additional set of commands right there in your environment. Now, uh, there have been quite a few extensions already developed. Those are quite nicely uh, you know, uh, documented within a project page for crash. In addition to that, there are crash extension languages as well that we are going to see in the next slide. So these are two most popular and fundamental crash languages. One is the EPPIC, that is Embeddable Preprocessor Interpreter for C. We had crash extensions written in this language in Red Hat for quite some time. And eventually, uh, we started facing you know, difficulties with the flexibility that it was providing. We had to maintain different crash extensions for different kernel versions. Maybe for RHEL 5.6, we had to have one crash extension compiled and usable. Then for RHEL 6.2, for RHEL 5.8, 6.4, likewise, and so on and so forth for 7.1, 7.3. So maintaining all these different extensions for different, different releases were quite cumbersome, right? And you know, every now and then, support engineer has to know which extension to load and all these things. It is good uh, for small projects. It is writable in C, but uh, you know, whenever your uh, and a crash extension project becomes huge. At that time, it becomes you know, cumbersome in doing all these program checks and within EBPIC. The Another one is PYKDAMP, uh, on, which is the main focus of this particular session. It allows the Python bindings to GDB and crash internals. Uh, so I, I would say the beauty of Python programming language is that the programmers do not need to explicitly learn Python program, right? You can just open a Python program, start reading it, and you will understand it and you can go on modifying it. In fact, for me, I didn't know Python before I started working on this project. It was where I opened the programs and just you know, started working on that. The features of PYKDM, it's, you, know, uh, you can split your crash extension in multiple different files, and even then, uh, the time required to load all this crash extension on the files is quite reasonable. So it doesn't require too much time in loading all these modules and stuff like that. It is completely based upon Python 3, so all the powerful features that you already have within Python 3 are ready to use within your extension language itself. It's pro it uses the robust error, error handling mechanism that is derived again right from Python 3. 
as well as it provides the ability to execute the crash commands itself and the crash command options within those extensions. So you will get its output parsed in a string, and that string can be again pro you know, processed within the Python programs. So you can format a nice report for the users based upon the checks performed by those programs. Now, there are some more features of PYKDEM which makes it a premier choice for writing the crash extensions. It, the same extension could be used for multiple different Linux versions. Uh, currently, uh, the stable and usable version of crash extension, this PYKDEM uh, binary, is available from its upstream project page and it's being used within Red Hat and a couple of other vendors as well. It is able to process the VM cores collected from RHEL 5.6, RHEL 6 all the minor releases, RHEL 7, all the minor releases, Fedora, Ubuntu, SUSE, OEL, any other major Linux distribution, as well as the upstream Linux kernel. You get the same binary to process the VM core collected from all these kernels. Now, how it does is the beauty of this particular framework that we'll discuss in the next slides. And uh, all these things, you know, developers get a chance to automate their, you know, uh, skills and analyzing the right set of information from the VM core. So next time they don't have to write, do this analysis manually. They just run the program, this analysis is done, and report is out, pointing out to the potential bugs or rest conditions within a kernel. Right. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about Python uh, KDEM framework design, about you know, how it achieves all these features, right? You might be you know, wondering, let's, let's work on rel 5, rel 6, Fedora, Ubuntu, SUSE, and any other Linux distribution, upstream kernel, all these things. So basically, it initializes the Python object based upon the C structures or unions that are present within a Linux kernel source code. And once a Python object is initialized, all these attributes will correspond to the you know, variables within those particular structures and unions. So as soon as the Python object is initialized, all you have to do is in your, uh, in your Python program, you can just use it as a normal Python object and attributes would represent the variables within those structures. So it's, once the Python object is initialized, it's just normal Python programming, right? And this Python objects, uh, apart from that, uh, the C data types are mapped to the corresponding Python data types. For example, integer is mapped to integer in the Python and the operators within C are mapped to the similar operators within Python. We'll actually see a demo uh, at the end of this presentation, so which would make it easier to understand you know, how all these features work together when we actually do the analysis, right? This one caveat, uh, while talking about the operators, because C provides you two uh, very powerful operators, it's a dot and an arrow, that's to dereference a pointer and the member variable that is directly embedded within a structure. But Python doesn't have these two operators, it just have a dot, for example, uh, here is the dereference chain that would look for a C structure named pointer that is having a, a pointer named A that is having a member variable called B, member variable called C, and further a pointer named D. This would be the dereference chain in C, while if we go on doing the same dereference chain in PYKDM framework, it would be just pointer A dot B dot C dot D. It is intelligent enough to identify if we are dereferencing a pointer or just a member variable that is right embedded within a structure. In doubt, queries so far? Yeah, thank you. So we discussed that uh, based upon the mapping rules, Python objects are initialized by PYKDEM framework uh, from the corresponding C structures and unions. Now, to ease this analysis and initialize these Python objects, uh, the PYKDEM framework provides a set of built-in routines. We, uh, there are quite extensive set of those built-in routines, but uh, you know, for the benefit of time, I'm not mentioning all these things over here. It would go out of scope of this session. So two most important Python KDEM API uh, functions are read SU and read symbol. Now, read SU, as the name itself suggests, it is to read the structure or the union from the VM core and initialize the corresponding Python object. This is the API call that is directly usable uh, within a programs written in PYKDump. And read symbol, uh, get a Python object corresponding to the kernel object defined as a global variable within the C program, right? So it could be a global, sim uh, that global symbol might be spring, integer, or structure based upon its type. It would automatically initialize a Python object or integer or string. And then once it's initialized, it's all the job of normal Python program to process it. 
These are a few more uh, quite powerful uh, built-in functions that are right available within PYKdump. As the name itself suggests, execute crash command in the background and return its output in a string, so it's right available within Python program to process it and you know, pro provide a nice report to the users. Again, uh, sometimes what happens, uh, suppose a VM code is collected from the system that is having thousands of processes running, right? If you just do ps m, uh, it might take you know a couple of minutes to complete that to list the information about all the processes. In those situations, we can even uh, specify the timeout so that uh, you know uh, we can just timeout instead of just waiting on those checks to perform. Second, uh, another one is enum info that is to pull out the uh, enum information from th your VM core. The uh, enums are quite extensively within, used within Linux kernel just to represent the state of a uh, particular, maybe for example, particular device. Let's take an example of a SCSI device. It's uh, using enum to represent its state, for example, uh, is they running blocked offline, transport offline, and stuff like that. All this information can be easily retrieved just using this enum info. Member size, that is used to inspect the size of a member variable within your Python program and the member offset to inspect the offset of particular variable within a structure or union. Right. So uh, this is the syntax of read, ASU, read structure, API call that we discussed in the previous slides. So the first argument would be the structure name that we want to retrieve. Second argument is the address from, we want to, uh, from where we want to retrieve it. Now, and the return, uh, it would return a Python object initialized that would we could start using within a Python program. This would make the example pretty clear. Now, here is, are the manual steps in retrieving uh, the HD struct uh, member within struct gen disk. Now, uh, those people who are familiar with you know, Linux SCSI subsystem and have been doing the VM core analysis for quite some time, the gen disk structure is quite fundamental structure to hold the device information, right? This gen disk has a member variable called HD struct. It is uh, named as part zero. All you have to do in crash environment is use uh, print struct gen disk, uh, mention the address of gen disk structure, and the part zero, there is a member variable, all you get the address for HD struct, right? You, um, there are many people over here who are familiar with this particular command. If you want to do the same thing in Python program written in PYKDEMP, uh, well, all that we need is the address for gen disk. That, uh, for example, if you have a block device structure, that is uh, having a pointer for gen disk, then that bd underscore disk, that is a pointer that could be used within you know, uh, the Python program just as this. I will explain uh, this one as, this is the Python object, uh, HD struct, that is to be initialized using the read su API call by uh, passing the first argument, that is the name of the structure that we want to uh, in, you know, retrieve, and the second argument is the address from where we want to retrieve it. The second argument is BD disk dot part zero. The BD disk is a pointer for gen disk and it is a member variable called part zero, right? So in just one statement, we have got a Python object initialized for this HD struct member variable. And this Python object is ready to use within your programs. Right. Now this would make uh, the things even more clear so if you want to print that particular HD struct object or the structure, all you have to do is a normal print statement within Python. And just print it, it will print out its address. If you want to print out uh, its member variables, then just do HD struct dot that particular attribute name or the member variable name, you will get its you know, value over there. Again, you can use your, you know, uh, those fancy statement, uh, you know, options within print statement to print in hexadecimal, binary, decimal, or of your choice. And this is one more uh, example of the built-in function that is execute crash command in the background. Uh, so this is a very, uh, I would say, uh, ugly example that we have been using a uh, long time back, but you know, it would still serve the purpose to explain this particular command. So uh, sys command is the fundamental command in crash. It would provide you the basic information about uh, the dump. For example, the panic string, load average, when the dump was collected, and the from system, CPUs, task running, and stuff like that. You can just execute this sys command by using execute crash command in background. Sys, there is a command that we are executing. And you can parse this particular output of the command as a string processing. 
and you can match uh, the release string within that particular output to compare it with the kernel version. If it's 2.6.32, it would say uh, it's rel6, while it's 3.10 or something, it means it's rel7 and stuff like that. Right. It's as easy as that. But, uh, we are not using this particular checks in uh, current version of the PYKDM. This is just as an example to demonstrate how we can execute the crash commands in background and parse its output as a string. Now, uh, the Linux kernel development you know, um, is rapid paced and there are a lot of changes keeps happening every now and then. Uh, there are chances that the definition of different structures within Linux kernel might get changed over the period of time. Uh, there would be definitely be, you know, uh, you know, very good reasons for that. There would be justifications, mailing list discussions and all the set, and eventually those structure definitions are bound to change for the good reasons. But if we write the crash extensions, by keeping in mind particular set of so, you know, structure definitions, then the chances that if that particular structure gets changed over the period of time, then our extension might not work with those dumps. Right. So uh, in PYKDM framework, we have a API call called member size that we can use to verify if the particular structure has a member variable with that particular name and with a particular size. If that particular member exists, then we will go on processing uh, that particular variable, or otherwise we can you know, look for another match, you know, or modify our programs to look out for another match that corresponds to the new structure definition changes. This is how it works with different kernels. Uh, this could be for SUSE, OEL, Fedora, Ubuntu, and all those things. Now this is how uh, we can explain it in a better way. This is from the latest upstream uh, code, the elevator.h header file. It is a uh, definition for elevator queue, which is a pointer uh, for stuck elevator type. It's, um, uh, within, uh, it's within stuck elevator queue. And the name of that pointer is type, right? Uh, before this particular structure definition, the code was looking like this. There was a variable, uh, there was a pointer with a name elevator underscore type, which was changed by this particular commit, and it changed its name to elevator uh, just type. So if you have written the crash extensions, by keeping in mind this particular pointer name, there are chances that our crash extension would start failing when it doesn't find this particular variable present in your VM Linux, right? Now, we can use that member size API call to intelligently verify what is the member variable name inside the structure. For example, the first if statement, uh, and one more thing, uh, like the member size function, if it identifies that there is a valid size of that particular uh, variable within a structure, then it would return uh, a valid value that is uh, not minus one. It could be 10, 20, or whatever the size of that particular uh, variable. Now, for the first if statement, it would say member size to check the member size of, uh, of, the, uh, of the variable within struct elevator queue, if there exists a member uh, called elevator and score type, then it would return something that is not minus one, right? In that case, we can go on processing that elevator underscore type pointer, uh, maybe uh, we can get the elevator name uh, right from it, and we can continue processing the rest of the stuff in program. If it returns minus one, that indicates that member variable did not exist then we can apply that knowledge of you know, kernel internals to add another check to verify if that member variable has a name just type, then just use that one over there in the next else if statement. If that also is not present over there, then at least we have a chance to flag an error message to the user that, hey, it didn't exist. So instead of just coming out of the program and saying error, we have the chance to print this information that would be usable. Now, exception handling, uh, it's quite robust as it's derived right from Python 3. So um, there are many chances. For example, uh, you know, when our dump is collected, at the time, it is already something unexpected happening on your system, right? It might have got crashed due to some unexpected reasons, due to some race conditions, due to some bugs. For example, a typical uh, scenario is storage ports flapping, and your devices are getting offline, coming back online, and you know, again, it's going down. At the time, whatever SCSI commands uh, that we are sending to those particular devices, there are very high chances that those SCSI commands might not be valid. Those might be being processed by error handling mechanism. Those might get freed, might get aborted, or might get retried, and stuff like that. At the time, if, we, if the crash extension 
tries to process some SCSI command that is already freed or some of the SCSI device structures that are already freed, then there are chances that it might just crash. So we are trying to analyze the crash, and our crash extension itself might fail in those scenarios. In that case, uh, you can just apply uh, the try except block right from Python 3. Put your statement within a try block. If it works, all you get is a Python object initialized. And if it doesn't work, at least you get a warning message that, hey, this particular structure doesn't look valid, and there is some error with that. So we can perform a manual review of that particular structure to identify what went wrong. Right. Any doubts, queries so far? Are we good to go? Thank you. Using all these different features and you know, uh, capabilities within PYKDOM framework, there are ready-to-use programs uh, already available within this framework. As the name itself shows, uh, Export Show is one of those programs which displays the TCP IP information, the sockets for, uh, you know, established at the time of crash. You can get this information from the VM core. Crash info, it is to show the general information from the VM core, as well as SCSI Show to print the detailed information over from the SCSI subsystem. It includes your SCSI devices, the SCSI commands, elevator, what was the sector that were referenced by those SCSI commands, elevator type, and what were the SCSI commands, age, and everything. DM show, it is used to print LVM information, multipath information, as well as to run some of the automatic heuristics and checks within the VM core to identify potential fixed box and report it to the user. Task info, as the name itself suggests, it prints the task information uh, from the VM core. And last two are as NFS show. It is to print the NFS client and server information from the VM core. So you don't have to go through those you know, RPC-related structures or NFS-related structures from the VM core. You can just type NFS show hyphen hyphen client or hyphen hyphen server, and it will display this information right on the crash prompt itself. The hang info. If the VM core is collected from a system which has got stuck for maybe hours, for it's for a few minutes, still hang info. If you just run it, it will display a summarized information about hang. Kind of, it will try to uh, format a tree as well about you know what were the tasks that were hung at the time. If it was waiting for another task, if it was waiting for another task, it will try to print the tree out of this information. Now, this is about the. Uh, Upstream project page, it is hosted on sourceforge.net, uh, ready to use binary that is containing all the programs discussed in previous slide are right there. All you have to do is just download, use the extend command to extend your crash environment and start using these programs. There is no extra need to compile it separately, just download and use it with the extend command. If you at all you want to modify or you want to compile it separately for different architecture apart from x86, maybe for PPC, for S390, there are already the manual steps to build the, uh, this PYKDOM binary. All you have to uh, get is the source code for the zip utility, for the crash utility, and for Python, just to get it compiled. And you will get a ready-to-use program. Now, I will show you a quick demo about uh, the VM core analysis, how it makes the life easy. And in fact, this is from one of the real-world examples that I encountered during my work uh, there in Red Hat. Now, uh, this is one of the VM core uh, that was collected from a system that was, uh, you know, crashed due to the sysrq utility, and uh, that sysrq uh, was triggered when the hung task panic sysctl parameter was uh, enabled. The khung task dthread, uh, it found that there are some processes stuck in D state for more than 120 seconds, and it triggered the crash. Now, from the panic string, it's quite visible that, uh, is this visible till last, or shall I increase the font? Yep. Is it good? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the panic string, as itself suggests, uh, there were hung tasks due to which the k hung task D had crashed the system, and sysctl parameter hung task panic was already enabled. So at this time, if we just run a bt command, we don't get very useful information because this was sysrq that has crashed the system, right? And in this particular case, bt is not at all useful. All we have to do is, once again, go to the PS list, get the list of processes, 
that were stuck in D state for more than 120 seconds. These are all the processes that were stuck in D state for more than 120 seconds. Now, the longest stuck task was in uninterpretable state or D state for more than 3 minutes and 47 seconds. So let's set the context for that particular task. Now, so we have set the context for this task and it's a backtrace of this particular task which was stuck in D state for more than 120 seconds. Now, all these things, uh, you know, will lead us only to the program that was stuck in D state for more than 120 seconds. But what's next, right? We want to identify why it got stuck in D state for more than 120 seconds. Now, the backtrace and the function call says that uh, it was trying to get a write access for the journal. It was trying to commit something in the journal writes, but it took more than 120 seconds, and that's where Kantasti crashed the system. Now, here, the kernel hackers or developers could apply their knowledge of this particular function sets to verify what were the first arguments passed to these functions, how it was passed, and it would also require the knowledge of assembly language to pull out all this information and verify what was the device, whether it was a LVM volume or a multipath device, or it was just a partition like SDB1 or something like that. Now, doing all this analysis manually would require at least an hour's time, right? Going through those structures, then going through the member structures, pointers, finding out if it's LVM volume. Again, you have to go into the LVM you know, uh, device mapper code, find out what were the underlying devices. Now, if, the, if you go on manual analysis, then it would be, yeah, some of these functions, for example, you know, let's just, so this particular function has a first argument passed as a super block. There is a super block corresponding to the file system. So we have to trace out what was this particular argument, its address, and from there we have to track out what was the file system, whether that file system was an LVM volume, it was a multi-part device, or it was just a partition on a SCSI device. So we don't want to do all this analysis manually. We have the programs to do this now. So all you have to do is extend the crash environment. Just normal crash command. So it has loaded the crash extension. If you want to review uh, the programs available in this particular extension, just type extend. It will list. There is, there is a set of commands of the programs that we discussed in the previous slides. There is crash info, task info, SCSI show, DM show, NFS show, and so on and so forth. Right. Now uh, I will just quickly do. So I will just load all the modules required for this analysis. Okay, you got the device mapper module also loaded, so all I have to do is dm show hyphen hyphen lvs. Okay, so this is the output, similar to lvs output within your running system. All you get is the lvm volume name, its volume group, whether it's open, its open count, its size, its underlying physical volume, right there in the crash output. Right. Now, again, if you uh, want to find out the UUID of those LVM volumes, you get those LVM UUIDs also right there, as well as volume group UUIDs. Right. Now back to that particular task which has got crashed. Now here are some of the you know, kind of a basic checks or the knowledge of this particular extension could be applied. Now the crashing task was flush 253 column 3. Now here the 253 three are the major minor numbers of that particular device on which the journal writes were stuck. Now the 253 minor number would always, in most of the cases, would be used for something uh, created on top of device mapper objects. Now in this case, it is uh, you know uh, easy to say it was DM3 because it was a device mapper object. The major number suggests, and a minor number is three, so it is DM3. So just get back to our previous command. So here is DM3. It was LV underscore app one. It was hosted on this particular VG. It was created on SDC, right? So within this many seconds, only 0 0.4 seconds, 0 0.04 seconds, we have got all this information. While doing this manual review would have required more than two hours, right? 
Now we want to trace out what was this disk SDC and what were the commands or IOs were pending on it. So, so we'll type uh, SCSI show. There is a program discussed in the previous slide to print out digital information about SCSI subsystem. See, this is the output. I will just reduce the font to make it quite visible in a better way. So this is your disk SDC. It is connected to host 2 adapter that is of the type VMware PV SCSI adapter. You will also get the address for that SCSI host adapter. Again, the number of requests pending, the status of that particular device, number of pending requests that is in the bracket, uh, the difference between done count and the pending and the number of IO errors on that particular device. Similarly, it prints information about all the devices. Right. Now, this has uh, brought us to that particular device on which the IO was stuck. Right. The next task would be why the IO was stuck. Now, let's get to that one. There's one more option, hyphen, hyphen, check. So you don't have to do those analysis manually. These programs are written with you know, uh, the experience that we have developed, uh, that, we, that we have got while working with the customers on a number of customer cases. And you know, th there are a lot of support engineers. Uh, like, uh, I would tr uh, like to put their names also in the slides, uh, like David Jeffrey, Lawrence Overman, and these are senior people in Red Hat who helped to build this extension to the mark that we can perform all these checks automatically. Now, if you run this check, it has shows that there were so many SCSI commands Depending on this particular device, also you get HCTL values, host, channel, target, LUN ID. And uh, it has a large timeout of 180 seconds. And it has passed the 180 seconds timeout. Still, error handling was not triggered on those particular commands. And as the timeout was already passed, that is more than 120 seconds. And the Khang task D identified that the tasks are stuck for more than 120 seconds. It crashed the system. Right. Now, we'll also see what were these all SCSI commands doing. <coughs> hyphen Q to print out the information of this, all the SCSI commands. You get a disk SDA. This is one of the disks which had, see, 13 commands pending. Uh, these struck request for each and every command. This is the BIO structure associated with it. The SCSI command structure associated with its opcode the age of that particular SCSI command, and a sector on which this particular SCSI command was referenced to. Yep. And similar stands to for the another device, that is SDC. There were this many 20 commands pending, and we can see, so there were total 33 commands pending, right? 20 here and 13 on SDA. So if you go on SCSI show, so this is this host adapter 2. It was not triggering error handling because the block count, sorry, the busy count was not equal to failed count. The number of busy commands uh, were not equal to number of failed commands. So it didn't trigger the error handling in first place. Now, what was that one command that was pending that we can just identify using this command once again? So all these commands had a timeout already reached more than 180 seconds, but here it was one more command. This is to see Okay, so on this particular device, there was one command that was having age of just 80 seconds. So we were waiting for this one particular command also to time out, and then the error handling would have got triggered. So basically, we were, you know, doing the, uh, we were going through the right path. Error handling would have got triggered once this command times out. But by that time, Kyang Task D already found that tasks are stuck in D state for more than 120 seconds, so it triggered the crash. It triggered the panic. So in this case, it was for VMware to identify uh, what went wrong with the VMware virtual disk. It was taking so much time that more than 180 seconds to complete the IOS to it. So this just, so I'll just quickly show one more uh, similar thing. I think doubts, queries regarding this, uh, we've got five minutes for this. Anything about uh, Python extensions, bindings, how it is being used. I will just show you. 
Any doubts, queries, any questions? Yeah, please. Can you get back to the slide about the member size? Yep. Here it is right yeah. there. So my question is, why do you do need this one? Why cannot you use the Python uh, commands to look whether the attribute is present in that object? Python, I think, right? Yeah, uh, so I repeated the question for the benefit of recording that uh, the question was, why can't we use the Python programming language facility itself to verify that attribute exists or not, right? Uh, the reason being this, uh, we are you know, uh, writing some certain checks, heuristic checks within the program to use those variables and identify what was the you know, uh, value of that particular variable and based upon that, trigger the flags for or errors. For example, that we saw that command has been timed out and error handling was not triggered and all these things. But you know, uh, once the Python object is initialized, we have no way to you know, uh, compare it with the structure definition from the VM Linux without actually comparing it. You, you have the structure already loaded. You have S SDF queue yep. object already. So why don't you check if the SDF queue doesn't contain elevator type? Because it is embedded within elevator queue, and elevator queue has a member variable called elevator underscore type. Oh, okay, yeah, it's a different structure. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, yeah, okay, I see. Yeah. So, uh, we can just use that structure, verify its member variable name. If it's proper, then we won't get minus one. We can start processing it. If you get a minus one, that means it doesn't exist. Okay, so can I use like the Python functions in case it like, like has the structure already? load it and just want to check for particular attributes? Of course, we can do that. But you know, uh, this framework is already doing that part for you. And it is providing this function. So it's just to use this function. It provides additional flexibility. That's the only reason for using this. But if you want to do that manually, Python allows you to do it. Okay. Yep, thank you. Any other question? We still have five more minutes, right? Yeah, yeah please. I have another question if no one wants to. Wants to. So why, you, you, have to, you have to cast into the long when passing through the SU function, and the long uh, recast. Why is there? Why cannot the SU function do it by itself? Uh, so that could be a suggestion for improvement. We can definitely take into that account, and we can eliminate that need for writing long. Yes, because every, uh, so the question was, why can't we just eliminate the requirement for putting long over there, while we already know the addresses would be in the long format. So that's, that's definitely an improvement area for us. You can put that in, yeah. Thanks for that. So I'll just, uh, if there are no questions, I'll just quickly show uh, from the other VM core as well that I have worked about the NFS information. Uh, sorry, this is one more from the storage issue only. Now this particular dump was collected from a system that was experiencing the storage issues, right? So, oops, I will not load it. Now this is uh, printing the whole information about SCSI commands on various devices. There are so many SCSI commands pending. And while processing these SCSI commands, sometimes you might encounter the request structure that is having a null SCSI command. For example, there are this many requests on this particular device, which were having the null SCSI command. Now, this null SCSI command could cause, could cause your system to crash during the error handling or while trying to abort this or while trying to retry, retry those commands, right? So all this information is you know, something not that we can retry by manual analysis. It would require hours of analysis, maybe a day's investigation to pull out all this information. But here you have all this information 
right at your fingertips just for all these devices. It also provides you all the information about its vendor model, its CTL values, its elevator type, like its deadline, CFQ, or no op, and likewise. And so Got one more VM core for NFS. Now it is printing the NFS client information that there were three <coughs> mounts uh, present on our system. We can just re-verify it with a mount command from the crash environment. So there were three shares that were mounted on our system. Oh, I'll just do this one. So there are three shares mounted on my system at the time of crash. If I want to pull out information about those clients, and structures, all I have to do is NFS show hyphen hyphen client. So I have got the NFS client structure pulled out from the VM core. Uh, if, how many seconds it was last used, its state, and all the useful information. So if you have any suggestions in improving this particular framework, it's, uh, you know, we will be more than happy to hear from you about you know, what all the pro, uh, you know, checks you would like to add to this particular framework. Please don't hesitate to contact me or Alex. Our email addresses are right there on the first slide. Recording and slides will already be shared. And we would be more than happy to hear your feedback on this particular framework and to make it more usable. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Remember, pleasure. Ah, then it's, uh, so the question was, when we are creating or uh, initializing the Python object from C structure or unions, whether we create a class or not, right? So we do, in fact, create a class. If you go into uh, definition of this particular read SU, that is in the Python framework source code itself, then you would see that read SU itself, uh, you know, is using those Python classes and everything to uh, selectively initialize those class and initialize those individual attributes from the member variables within a structure. So it does use classes in. Cool. And when you try to access something, like for example, if, if the member size, uh, and it fails because of different memory access for something, I guess it, it gives like different exceptions for different programs, right? So you can like differentiate. Is that the case? So for anything that is not valid, it would return minus one. Yeah, that is also already there. Try except. Yeah. So does it like return different exceptions for different yep. programs? So yep. Like record, like record, like, okay, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for example, in this particular slide, see. Now, uh, when we do pyl log warning. Uh, at that time, you will also get some more detailed information uh, about what was the error that we have encountered. So it will, addition, additional to this particular error message that we are printing, you will definitely get some more information. Now, if you get this information, all we can do is we can try to manually analyze that structure. At least, you know, just coming out without analyzing that, at least we get some hints or pointers. Any other questions, suggestions for improvement? We would be more than happy to hear that. So I think we are all uh, done with this. Thanks for joining in this particular session. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.